Shooting your videos in log is the best way to get the most dynamic range and color flexibility out of your camera, but it can be really hard to make those images look good or normal afterwards. It's so flat and desaturated, no contrast, that getting it back to a proper looking image can be difficult even for advanced filmmakers. But this video is gonna be easy enough for beginners to follow, but there are also things that I didn't learn for years of making videos, so hopefully everybody can learn something from it. I'm gonna be doing it using Resolve 17, but the same lessons are gonna apply in Final Cut Pro or Premiere Pro, whatever you're editing in, same techniques will be in all of them. And I'm gonna be doing it on this Razorblade 15 Advanced, and thanks to the sponsor of this video, NVIDIA Studio. So inside this laptop, we have an RTX 3070, and let me tell you why that's cool for what we're doing. It has some specific hardware acceleration that, I mean, a lot of creative programs use lately, but Resolve specifically has some very cool features that take advantage of it. First of all, it's got hardware decoding acceleration. This is only in the studio version, so check out NVIDIA's site for a list of the features that are in the free version, because it's a little bit different. But you're gonna wanna go to Preferences, make sure that it's turned on. I'm gonna turn off Auto on both of these so we can see it's using CUDA cores and it is selecting the NVIDIA GPU. So that'll speed things up a lot. And we're gonna be using this footage that we shot for our sky replacement tutorial. So check this out. We've got this beautiful shot of Anya here, but if we wanted to make some refinements, we could go to face refinement, drag it onto one of our nodes. And if we say analyze, it is gonna track her face throughout the whole scene in complete 3D. So even if she moves her head and the hat obscures, it still works. So then there's adjustments we can target to just her face. I'll turn them up too far so you can see it. Like there's brightening for her eyes. That'd be way too much. So we just do like a little notch, sharpening her eyes. That's almost always useful. Reduce bags under the eyes, light the eyes a little more. And then there's also some skin smoothing with the beauty slider. This is all enhanced through AI using NVIDIA's tensor cores. It goes way faster. Let's say we wanted to do slow motion, but we didn't shoot it that way. So here it is playing back at 20%. It's incredibly choppy, of course, like what else would it be? So now I'll go to the inspector over here on the right and I'll select read time process and optical flow. So now when I play it back, it's smoother, but you can see some crazy weird artifacting. Like it doesn't look realistic. And now on this last clip, you can see what AI really does. If I switch motion estimation to speed warp, when I play it back, it's totally smooth. Like it looks realistically smooth. It's automatically filling in all the pixels in between. Like fake slow motion has always looked fake. And here, I mean, it, it looks real, it's crazy. DaVinci Resolve isn't the only app that benefits from Nvidia's GPU acceleration. Photoshop has some cool machine learning too. And I did a whole video about sky replacements. So check that one out. So whether you just want to decode H.265 faster or you've got some crazy special effects, NVIDIA Studio laptops accelerate that whole workflow so you can get your job done a little bit sooner. So thanks again to NVIDIA for sponsoring this video. Let's get into it. I think some people imagine that color grading or photo editing or any of that stuff is some kind of magic bullet where you make footage look cinematic. It's garbage in, garbage out. No matter which camera you're using, if you're shooting something that looks bad, you may not be able to save it in post, so you have to get your exposure right, your white balance, your lighting, all these things need to be correct before you get it into DaVinci. So these are just some random clips from the day shot on the Canon C70, all in C-Log2. So as you can see, very flat, no color at all to it. We're gonna fix that. So we're gonna start here in the color panel and I'm just gonna create a couple of nodes. If you're not used to working in Resolve, nodes are just like layers. I mean, the same rules apply again in Premiere and Final Cut, but it is always important to think about separating which thing happens first and where it is. So I'm sure you've seen people do things like, okay, it's really flat. I'll turn up the contrast, turn up the saturation. And now we've got, I mean, yeah, it looks like footage. It's kind of back to normal. If we look at our waveform over here, you can see, I mean, it fills it out. Maybe it's a little overexposed. So, you know, maybe we bring the whole thing down a little bit, but please don't get into the habit of doing this manually until you're a bit of an expert because it's challenging to do. Gerald Undone has a great video going into all the details of that, but it takes a little bit more work to do it manually. What I recommend most people do is find a really good transform LUT. So I'm gonna reset all that and I'm gonna open up my LUTs. I have found one and uh, I've made it and it's, there'll be a link to it in the description below. And if I add it, uh, I instantly get what I know is gonna be the predictable look out of my C70. Now there are a ton of cameras out there. I can't tell you exactly which one is gonna work well for you, but every manufacturer does make their LUTs available on their website. 
other independent developers make them as well. So mine is just for Canon, but you can also get great Sony ones from Leeming LUTs. There's also buttery LUTs. A lot of them are built into Resolve. So if I right click on this, I can look through my LUT selection thing. And you can see like there's tons of them. If I go into, you know, Sony S-Log2, Sony S-Log3, we got some Canon ones. I don't love the built-in ones in Resolve, but spend like a week just testing a whole bunch of them and find the look that works for you as a good starting point before you completely grade your footage. This is so helpful. Go through this step first. I promise it'll help. An optional but extremely helpful tool if you're trying to match footage is a color chart. This one's very small and pocketable, but just getting one reference frame that uses the chart can really help you bring two different shots in different places, even on different cameras, to look exactly the same. And once you've got a light you're happy with, this is a really important one. Always put your main adjustments before the transformation. Again, this goes for every single app you might be using. So in this case, the image is a little bit overexposed. Maybe I'm gonna use the offset to do it. And yeah, you can really see, like the image just feels like richer, like the colors thicken up a little. I really like where it goes as I bring it down. But if I were to do it after the transform right here, I'm gonna just hide this. You get a very different response as you move things down. Now let's find a clip that's a better example. And now this shot. So it looks overall pretty good, but our clouds are definitely too bright. So I just wanna bring that exposure down a bit and especially recover these highlights. So here in the middle, I've got a transform LUT and let's see what happens if I make my adjustments afterwards. I'm just gonna bring the offset down and I can kind of keep going, but the clouds never really recover much detail there. And, and let's just choose point. I mean, I'm not really happy with this look, but that's what it is. Now let's hide this node and instead let's do it to the before node. And what you can see happening here is especially visible in the waveform. So check out our scope over here. All of a sudden these clouds here are like opening up. It's expanding the dynamic range. And if we go back to our after adjustment, it's just lowered that top of the image. It hasn't brought out any more detail. Whereas adjusting before we're extracting more and more detail in those clouds. The same thing goes for adjusting white balance or anything else. You are saving so much more information. You've got to do your big changes before the transform. And then typically, I mean, I'll add another LUT afterwards. At the end is where I'll do like a film emulation. So this one's just mine. And you can see it's like added a bit of that filmic look. Maybe I'm too dark now, but you get the idea. So major adjustments, smaller adjustments, then transform, then film emulation. And you can make minor tweaks at the end, but nothing big at the end all at the beginning. All right, now exposure. If an image is too bright or too dark, I see people messing around with every single slider trying to like dial it in. So this image is too bright. So like, you know, bring down like my highlights a bit and then it also maybe, you know, move my shadows around until they kind of hit the bottom. I'm looking at my waveform over here. The more dials you press, the more you can potentially mess things up. So I always find it most important to start with your midtones. That's really where exposure lives and it's gonna bring everything more gently down from the highlights to the shadows. So to demonstrate this another way, if you're, let's say using another app, that's grabbing the middle of your curves and bringing those down. That's what exposure really is. When you're grabbing these top two sliders, this is more about setting a white point and this is setting a black point, which are also important things to do, but most of the brightness of your image lives in the middle here. So this is what you wanna be moving up and down to have a natural adjustment to the overall exposure. If you're shooting log footage and you're starting from something extremely flat, it can be easy to forget just how desaturated and not contrasty it is. So sometimes I take a photo on either my SLR or on my phone and compare that to the log image. It'll give you a much better idea of what the final thing is supposed to look like. So if you've shot your image in raw on an SLR, I mean, first things first, you gotta correct it right. So I'm gonna go in here and set the white balance. This is in capture one. You can use whatever you want. I'm gonna recover a lot of the highlights so I can see what that blue was and a bit of the shadows. And that's what I'm gonna export and import it into Resolve over here. You can even just open it up in a window side by side. This is for your eyes to visually reference. So I'm just gonna look at them side by side while I do this, add my nodes grab transform. And you know what, color charts that we're using in this can be really helpful, but they are often a little more technical than what you really need to do to make the image look good. So I'm not gonna use it for this one. I'm just gonna eyeball it. The most important thing that I see right away is that my blue and greens are way off. I'm gonna pull up my vector scope. And so looking at our waveforms, they're not way off in like the overall contrast, like the high 
and low points still kind of land in the same place. But I would say there's a difference in the mid-tone contrast. So I'm gonna add that to my secondaries thing. In mid-tone contrast, it's when you grab the curves layer and you add that little S-curve towards the middle of the line instead of you know doing it far to the sides. It's something in here. So like to see an extreme example of it, like this is obviously way too much, it's a different look than doing overall bigger contrast adjustments. So I'm gonna do kind of a, a small one here, somewhere in the middle. And then in terms of saturation, I can see my greens and my blues are pretty far off. The skin uh, saturation is kind of similar, but the tone's different. We'll deal with that in a sec. So in my hue versus saturation, this is in most programs, I'm gonna go to my blues and bring that saturation up a little bit. And same with kind of the greens and yellows. These adjustments should be pretty wide to not cause damage. If you do really narrow adjustments, like, you know, kind of notching it like this. And then in my sort of greens and uh, yellows, I'm gonna bring that up a bit too. Oh, and I can see, actually I was targeting the wrong blue here. See her sweater is like getting really purple. That's not what I want at all. I'm gonna bring that purple down a little bit and bring my blues and my greens, I'm gonna bring them over in this direction. But that's also a sign that like our blues don't line up. And I know, yeah, I could be looking at the charts. I'm doing it by the image. So I'm gonna go into my hue versus hue. And this is gonna be a small adjustment because it can go too far real fast. Just pushing the blue away from the reds a little bit. I can also see my clouds are not recovered as much, which photos can usually recover a bit more in terms of highlights and shadows, but let's try bringing our highlights ladder down until they kind of feel similar. Our blues are oversaturated, so I'm gonna tweak that. Our skin tone is a little more pink in the video. And now I'm not completely dead on, but if I do a before and after, you can see it's like, it's getting pretty close. And I find if you just try to do this by eye, really often you can end up with not enough contrast. That's the most common thing. Because you're seeing this huge jump from log to not log, you can think it's contrasty, but relative to normal photography, it's not. And now the last one that's kind of the easiest, but maybe the most important is keep an eye on your white point. So many people miss this. Okay, so I'm just gonna create another node here. I'll just, I don't know, move it over here to separate it. And this is gonna be for our white point. All I wanna demonstrate is that you need to keep an eye on the waveform here and not let it clip no matter what. Clipping, pure white, that means digital. That's what a website looks like. So if you upload this on the internet and you've got white parts around the outside, which I would right now, looking at my scopes, I can tell that that background would be pure white. It will look wrong. You always want it to be at least down, just like a little tiny notch. And you're having trouble keeping that consistent between all your clips, you can look at your waveform monitors. I like to add a little high reference point, see that faint line so that, you know, whatever's supposed to be clipped is just below clipping and this will separate your video from any kind of digital background. Same goes for photography, just, don't let anything clip. That's probably the biggest thing you can do for making something look cinematic. But if you really wanna make something look cinematic, I've got just the video for you and it's coming up next. So just click on it. There's a, there's a, there should be a box. Click that box. I'll see you over there. <laughs>